Welcome to the Vermont Urban Community Forestries webinar, Planning for EAB, Stories from Around the State. My name is Elise Shadler, and I work for the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a partnership between UVM Extension and Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. I will be moderating this evening. Our presenters tonight are Caitlin Cusack, Nancy Patch, and John Akilashek. Caitlin Cusack is an urban and community forestry outreach spe specialist for the University of Vermont Extension. Caitlin coordinates the Vermont Forest Pest First Detector Program and assists communities with the management of their urban and community forests with specific focus on forest health. Her favorite tree is a muscle wood. Yes, she likes the underdogs. Nancy Patch is the Franklin Grand Isle County Forester and member of the Enosburg Town Planning Commission. As a state employee, Nancy volunteered to help several communities in eastern Franklin County develop EAB preparedness plans. And John Akilashek is a Vermont tree steward, having taken the stewardship of the urban landscape course. He became a forest pest first detector shortly thereafter, and he initially volunteered with the Montpelier Tree Board in 2012 before he came a member of the tree board in 2013. So now I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin to start. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, it's great to um, be here to talk with you about the Emerald Ash Borer, and I'd like to start out the evening um, with a quick, to get a quick sense of where everyone is coming from tonight. So as you'll see, we've got choices A through E on the screen, um, and if you could just enter as Elise described um, where you all are from based on the number, which counties. Um, I'll give you a couple couple minutes to do that. And if you haven't found it already, uh, where you can find the, uh, the the letters to indicate your choice is uh, on the the row where um, on the top part of the participant chat box panel. Um, there's a, the first icon is a smiley face, and the last one, as Elise and Caitlin have said, is the uh, the letter. All right. Well, it looks like for those who have uh, have entered their response, we've got a group from up in the northwestern part of the state. Um, no one from the northwest corner, but uh, some folks down in the Windsor Windham area, and uh, some folks in central Vermont. So it's great to see we've got some good distribution throughout the state. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, so just another quick little quiz here, um, or quick little curiosity. Um, just to get a sense of where everyone's coming from in, in terms of their experience with the Emerald Ash Borer. So again, we've got statements sort of A through E here, uh, depending on sort of your level of involvement at this point with planning for the Green Menace. Uh, so I'll give you a couple minutes to just enter in your, your uh, answers. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for, uh, for sharing. Uh, where y'all are coming from, and it looks like we've got sort of a range of those that may not be currently involved right now, um, and those that uh, I know a couple of you have got draft Emerald Ash Borer preparedness plans. So um, this is great, and we look forward to uh, sharing and uh, having a conversation uh, about the planning for the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, so I will get started, and a little roadmap of where we're going this evening. So I'll provide a brief overview of community preparedness in Vermont. And then Nancy is going to share about a multi-town planning effort going up in her county, up in Franklin area, Franklin County. And then John's going to share about planning uh, in our state's capital, in Montpelier. And then I'll bring it around with lessons learned. So I welcome uh, you to, to uh, type any questions you may have as we go along in the chat box. And I'll sort of pause throughout my presentation, and we can uh, answer them uh, at that point. So as you can see by the map here, I'll get my little pointer going here. Here we are. We are surrounded. Um, and as of January 2014, there are a total of 22 states and two Canadian provinces that have become infested with the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, although EAB, the Emerald Ash Borer, has now been found in all sides of Vermont, these infestations are primarily outlying isolated infestations. Um, there's a huge benefit to being at the end of the line and that it gives us really a great opportunity to, look, to learn from other states and Canadian provinces um, and we're applying those lessons learned which you'll hear about tonight and really creating our own uh, and working with Vermont's municipalities. So I thought I'd do a quick overview just to bring you up to speed on what's going on in some of our neighboring states. So in New Hampshire they are implementing some management techniques to slow the spread 
of the Emerald Ash Borer, uh, and we'll be releasing some biocontrols such as this parasitic wasp um, that has been described as a, quote, gre gregarious parasitoid um, that ends up depositing its eggs on EAB larvae. Uh, so when these eggs hatch, it uh, then feeds on the EAB tissue and will eventually kill it. So on a related note, I also wanted to share with you all that uh, the USDA is anticipating the arrival for release of a Russian parasitoid um, that is thought to be more cold hardy than the, than the current ones that we have available to us. So on our neighbors to the north, um, you will see, whoops, New York, not neighbors to the north, there we go, in New York, um, you'll see that down in this area, there is a new detection in uh, Rensselaer County, which is pretty close to Vermont's border. And as you'll see, the quarantine for the Emerald Ash Borer still, still covers the southern portion of the state. Quick update on New York. And then finally, here we go, our neighbors to the north. In November, they did find two new infestations of the Emerald Ash Borer just east of Montreal. Um, and in Montreal, they've identified uh, about 150 infested trees. And they, like New Hampshire, are implementing managed techniques management techniques to slow the spread. Uh, the main technique they're using is treating trees within a certain radius um, of the infested trees with an insecticide. About 20% of Montreal's trees, for those that have been up there, are ash. Um, and so they'll be holding a one-day summit in March to come up with an island-wide strategy to stop slow the spread. And then finally, to our south in Massachusetts, you may have heard that in North Andover, which is right up here close to the New Hampshire border, they did find a new infestation. And so right now they're in the process of delineating that, uh, that infestation to figure out the boundaries of it so that they can figure out uh, how to set the quarantine. And so finally, the subject of tonight, what's being done in Vermont? And so, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, roughly 1 in 12 trees in Vermont are ash. And in total, they, they number over 150 million. It's an important component of the northern hardwood forest and a number of other wetland and upland natural communities. And here in Vermont at the municipal level, the focus of our talk tonight, it's historically been a favorite choice for street trees due to its fast growth and salt tolerance. Burlington, as an example, has an estimated 1,000 ash trees in the public right-of-way. Ash feed well into disturbed roadsides, and millions also line our back roads. A group of volunteers in Johnson, Vermont, estimated that they have over 2,200 trees lining their back roads. So towns will need to respond at a minimum to uh, deal with trees that become public safety hazards that they are legally responsible for under Vermont tree law. Uh, a town might still also need to help citizens deal with privately owned dead and dying ash trees that pose a risk to public safety. Uh, so you'll hear from Nancy and John tonight how they, they and their towns are dealing with some of these, these uh, concerns. And, and ultimately, it's really up to local governments, businesses, and private property owners to monitor and manage trees and pests in their own towns. So to give you a quick ballpark figure, um, sort of back of the envelope calculation on the direct cross, costs of removal and replacement, I mentioned in Burlington there are roughly 1,000 trees within their right-of-way. So to remove and then replace them, this is roughly going to cost the taxpayers of Burlington a half a million dollars. And then you think about some of our smaller towns, where it's mainly ash trees along their back roads that they're going to have to deal with. So in Johnson, I mentioned 2,200 trees within that right away. Roughly 20% of them, 440, are hanging over the road and could be an immediate hazard. And so if they hired out this work, that town, again, is looking at roughly $130,000 um, to deal with those trees over time. So with this much at stake, preparing for and responding to the Emerald Ash Borer is really a collaboration between all of our 251 local governments and a number of state and federal agencies. So at the federal level, this is really the US Forest Service, um, the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, um, and then at the state, we have our Agency of Agriculture, our Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, and then uh, University of Vermont and Extension. So we're guided by a, a strategy that's fourfold, and that's looking for the Emerald Ash Borer. We have four different techniques we use for that. Um, in order to prevent its introduction, 
In the first place, we inspect Agency of Agriculture staff, inspects nurseries and surrounding areas for exotic pests. And under the federal uh, quarantine, ash products from regulated areas, so those areas in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, can only be moved in Vermont if the shipper and that receiving facility have compliance agreements. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, quarantines in a moment. And then outreach and education. Those efforts are focusing on early detection, getting folks to look up, and, and really slowing the spread. And that since firewood is one of our top vectors for the spread, we target out-of-state visitors to please leave their firewood at home. So the subject of tonight's talk, we are targeting two main groups for preparedness activities, private homeowners and municipal governments. And this is based on research showing that these two uh, groups bear 80% of the costs of non-native forest insects, such as the emerald ash borer. And, and the challenge of planning for emerald ash borers is, is further compounded in the state by the fact that only a few municipalities have paid staff to care for their urban forests. Therefore, the responsibility in planning really relies on the willingness and capacity of volunteers like yourselves and those who we'll, we'll hear from, from tonight. So when the emerald ash borer arrives in Vermont, um, some of us, well, will probably need some CPR, but the protocol that will be used is as follows. First, the municipality where it's found will be notified. Then the state, with help from our volunteers um, and probably surrounding states, will conduct a survey to figure out the boundaries of that infested area. Uh, we will put a quarantine in place, which I'll discuss in a moment, and then towns will we'll start dealing with um, some of those hazardous trees, and that's either treating high-value trees or eventually um, dealing with those that are infested. And so when I say quarantine, what, what does that mean? Um, so infested logs, firewood, wood chips, those wood products um, can be moved from a quarantine area. So for example, Merrimack County, New Hampshire is a quarantine area uh, due to that, that de detection there. It can be moved from there to a non-quarantined area only if it's been treated and inspected before it's, be, before it's moved. For example, in order to move firewood outside of a quarantine area, it must be heat treated. And the wood temperature much, must reach a certain temperature for a certain period of time. So heat treatment chambers or kilns need to be certified by the federal agency in charge of that. Um, furthermore, you know, another thing to, to that how the quarantine affects us, that wood cannot be moved during the flight season for the emerald ash borer. So that's May through August. And so all of these certainly have significant impacts on, on members of the wood products industry. But the, the point of them is to really slow, slow the spread of this, this pretty damaging uh, insect. So I just want to take a minute and check in to see if we have any questions that have come up. Uh, so let's see, in the chat box I see one from Ken, uh, is the bee hole usually visible from the ground? So what Ken's referring to is one of the signs and symptoms of the emerald ash borer is, it's, is an exit hole that's bee shaped. And um, usually the, the insect uh, will attack the top of the tree first. And so you're only going to really see that exit hole up close um, when it's a pretty heavily infested tree. Um, binoculars, I, I, I don't know if, you know, I put it out there that I see Jim Esden and some other staff who have done some of this. Um, I don't know if binoculars in some of these areas you'd be able to even see these holes. They're an eighth of an inch, so it's pretty impossible. Um, so yeah, Ken, hope that answers your question. Thanks for that. Um, so, Kate and Elise, any other questions that sort of came up? Yeah, it looks like Michael uh, had a question about enforcing the quarantine and how that will be achieved. Yeah, thank you. So the quarantine um, is that, so the initially, the, the quarantine is eventually up to the state of Vermont to enforce. Uh, in the meantime, before that happens, the, the federal government manages that quarantine, but, but um, it is the state of Vermont that enforces it. And um, how? Well, right now, you know, the, the Department of Forest and Parks has been doing a lot of outreach and education to the forest products industry um, a, about that. And so it's really the enforcement is in developing those uh, compliance agreements with those, uh, the um, sawmills and other wood, wood producers. All right. 
So, Michael, thanks for that question. Um, so I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, let's see. So we're encouraging municipalities to develop a preparedness plan. Um, and as we mentioned, the city of Montpelier and uh, four other, there are three other communities have already developed one of these plans. And it outlines that town's goals and objectives and the actions that uh, they will take to meet the current or anticipated impact of forest pests such as the Emerald Ash Borer. And communities in Michigan, Ohio, and other states um, have already developed preparedness plans. And we've used these examples to create our template for Vermont. Um, and the preparedness plans will, will allow you um, and your community to answer many of these questions that are up on the slide. So the key compo components of these plans are an executive summary, and this is often uh, the only thing that most select board members and town leaders are, are really going to have time to read. And so this summarizes your findings and recommendations. Um, Hartford has a really nice example of how they summarize their ash inventory data, uh, not only for the back roads, but also their village trees. And then the, the management recommendations um, and preparations and actions, that will cover, you know, everything from which significant shade trees you want to treat and the process for doing that um, to where you're going to and how you're going to utilize some of this infested wood, wood from the trees that are going to come down, along with uh, any policies such as tree ordinances that we'll hear from uh, Nancy about. And so planning in many ways give the town more management options. For example, if you do have a significant um, historic ash tree in your town center, I know there's a, a really beautiful one that many folks often mention on Route 7 in Rutland, they need to be treated ideally before it's attacked by the emerald ash borer. And so, um, you know, important to identify those trees, have a public discussion about their pesticide use, budget for it, and really monitor for AB so you know when to, when to treat them. It'll give you more utilization options. Uh, there are fewer options from dead trees, um, which can uh, eliminate the potential income to offset those costs. It will allow, um, ideally, a, a community to save money or spread those costs out over time, and that if you are able to find other ways to utilize those trees, it could help offset the costs. You have time to coordinate with other towns um, for sharing equipment. Um, Pre-arranging contracts, seeking grants, or raising money. Dead trees are certainly more hazardous. I know that you know arborists and, and tree workers will will attest to this to uh, work with and, and have a tendency tendency to shatter. So it will cost you more uh, to take down those trees than when they're live or dying. And then finally, you know, experience in other states has shown that communities that don't prepare um, are really rushing at the last minute to deal with some of these replacing these lost trees, um, which that really compounds the impact significantly when you lose some of those trees in your in your town centers. So just a quick overview of the process here that the communities um, in Vermont have been using, um, and that's forming a, a planning team. And uh, some of the key folks are the forest per, forest per, forest pest first detector volunteers, tree wardens conservation commission members, teachers, and other folks that are well-connected in these communities. Um, and then to bring together a group of those folks along with other larger group of stakeholders to have an informational meeting. And uh, uh, staff are available to come and speak at those meetings. Recently, the Danville Conservation Commission hosted an information meeting where over 45 um, residents from surrounding towns attended. And then it all parts throughout the process, um, the communities have found that um, briefing the decision makers has been really important to bringing them up to speed on the issue. And uh, again, state staff can provide uh, support for, for attending those meetings. And then, of course, you know, a key component, what's the potential impact? So doing a quick inventory um, of, your, of your community's uh, tree resource. And then looking at assessing your community's level of preparedness and prioritizing what action steps need to be taken to prepare that community. And finally, formalizing that action into a plan and, and having it uh, adopted by the town's decision makers. So now you see in the, in the sort of the darker blue, we have about 21 communities in Vermont actively planning for the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, Middlebury, Hartford, Brattleboro, and Montpelier were some of the first communities to start planning about a year ago. And all these 21 communities um, are in various stages of development, development of that EAB plan. Four communities, Hartford, South Burlington, Rutland, and Montpelier, have completed a preparedness plan. 
Um, while others um, are working on or have wrapped up their ash tree inventories, and others are just starting um, and have just held the public information meeting. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over so you can hear from the front lines from folks, um, John and Nancy, what they've been doing uh, working with their communities and lessons they've been learning. So uh, Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Caitlin. I'll move on to uh, my slides. And uh, as the Franklin County Forester, I volunteered to help a number of communities in the uh, in our in my county, and I actually also am a member of the Enosburg Conservation Commission, so it worked out real well for me to help Enosburg as well. Uh, the first thing we did was to um, just present a general outreach meeting that uh, seven different towns uh, came and listened to a, a presentation similar to what you're seeing tonight uh, that Caitlin has provided just to give an overview of the Emerald Ash Borer and what it, what it is and what, how, where it's been found and infested. And, and from there, it was, this was a great meeting to have um, that had a lot of community members there because at that meeting, they, there was a bunch of people that just said, well, you know, we don't really understand this completely. We are a little bit afraid of doing this all on our own. So why don't people raise their hands that want to convene and work on this together. So what happened out of this initial informational meeting was that we ended up with a multi-town kind of task force that was able to work together, answer questions, give each other support. Um, and it turns out that the four towns that were there were local towns. We had, we had other communities there from further away, and so it didn't make sense for them to uh, engage with us. But these four towns, Bakersfield, Enosburg, Fairfax, and Richford, uh, all got together and uh, decided to work on this together. They also, everyone also applied for the preparedness grant funding and all have received the $500 to help us out. So why did we determine that multi-town made sense? Um, you know, we're, we're able to share experiences and going forward with uh, not only the inventory but putting the plan together. We thought we also it would also be valuable uh, within our communities, because we all we were so close to each other, we're all contiguous um, land uh, towns. To have kind of the same message going out to the community, um, it, it made more sense that if someone lived in Bakersfield, but they also knew people in Enosburg, that they were hearing the same things. So we thought that would be very helpful. We also thought it would be good to share the workload. Everybody's a volunteer out there, and it's uh, there's limited time in our lives so we could then spread out uh, different tasks amongst the group, therefore getting a lot more done. Um, also, from my own standpoint, being a, a state employee and, and very engaged with this, with this effort, I, I have limited time, so it was really helpful for me to be able to work with multiple communities at the same time. It just really raised the efficiency for getting um, preparedness plans in place. So that's, this multi-town planning just made a whole lot of sense, and I, I highly encourage it for others who are just starting out. And so when we when we first did get started, you know, you, you get together and you, you you kind of waffle around a little bit. But, but so the first thing we did was really to identify who our chair would be. And I I was very clear not to be the chair. Um, as a as the professional advisor, I I chose it would make more sense if someone else was doing some of those other roles. And um, there were some some really active people in this group, so there were a lot of volunteering. So we identified the leadership roles. Um, we just we wanted to decide kind of how we're going to go about this. Should we have one plan for all four towns, or should we have separate plans? And it turns out, it turned out that it may just made more sense to have separate plans because our town road crews are going to be making those decisions in the end, and those road crews don't necessarily work together. We also wanted to figure out what kind of inventory methods we were going to have, um, and it was initially thought that we should all do everything the same way, but that also became a little bit more difficult depending on how many people were, were willing and able to volunteer, um, whether there was professional uh, um, input in some of the towns that other towns didn't have, uh, 
how do we get the work done? You know, is it volunteer or is it hired? You know, we had five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars helped a lot, but it certainly didn't wouldn't pay for uh, an inventory and a plan to be put together if you hired the work out. So a lot of these decisions had to be made at at that meeting and and at uh, subsequent meetings as well. So we but we did get our framework in place very quickly within that first first or second meeting, we got kind of these things all, all taken care of. The biggest piece of, uh, well, that may not turn out to be the biggest piece, but the biggest piece so far has been um, trying to figure out how to do the, the inventory of ash along the roadsides. Um, we are all four towns, very rural. So we really didn't have uh, cityscapes to look at or or parks. So we're really looking at town roads. And it's important, as Caitlin mentioned earlier, to start engaging the decision makers in your town really right from the start. And so we did certainly we worked with the town road crews, with the the foremans and the the select board, even the in the planning commissions in some towns got very engaged. Most of the volunteer efforts that were coming in from the communities came from the local conservation commissions. So Bakersfield, Enosburg, and Richford, the volunteers were really conservation commission members, so already part of the town government. Fairfax doesn't have a conservation commission, so their their work really came from uh, some volunteers that were uh, pretty efficient in their own right. We engaged uh, the Boy Scouts and some other some other groups to um, to help. Um, so we worked with the town to prioritize the roads. That was our first step. You know, we can't cover the entire town, or typically you can't with with limited time and money. So we prioritized which roads were most important to take a look at. We determined which which uh, towns were going to do volunteer work or who was going to hire out. Um, it turned and it actually turned out that every there was mostly volunteer, but we had some absolutely wonderful intern help from the University of Vermont. Several, uh, I think, uh, Richford and Fairfax both received some excellent assistance from UVM students. Bakersfield Conservation Commission, two members did the the, uh, the inventory and the same in Enosburg, two members. Um, it was also decided where we were going to go in terms of what we were going to gather for information. Uh, and that actually ended up being kind of all over the place too, depending on what time people had. Bakersfield, Richard, and Fairfax all took information on diameter classes, uh, breaking them down into different size classes, uh, and also the condition. In Enosburg, uh, we just took a GPS location of uh, every ash tree that we identified, but without any additional data. OK. This is uh, an example of the end result of uh, the inventory in Enosburg. So we have we ended up with uh, this is an index map that you're looking at. I'll try to turn on my button here. Um, okay, yeah. So this uh, this is the town of Enosburg, as you can see in the in the red outline. That's Enosburg. It's Enosburg Village, which has a separate government, by the way. So we, the town of Enosburg actually is not inventorying the Enosburg Village, although they have an inventory from years ago with a very minor component of ash. So in each of these insets, this is a separate little map that would be produced. And this is an example of one of those maps over here. So would be um, there's different scale maps depending on how intense the uh, ash was found. Our, this is one road that had the highest density of ash on it. So there's a, a number of smaller maps that are produced to show where the ash is. And this is a, uh, one of those maps. And each of these yellow dots is an ash tree. They are numbered. We have a database. It's all in a GIS arc map. So there's an attribute table that, that is accompanying this. Um, so this is an example of, this is bomb. We've, we've volunteer labor had taken the inventory data, but then we hired, we used the money that was given to us through the grant to hire a professional um, to produce the maps themselves. So the money came in very handy to be able to produce these maps. And 
And a professional, he spent three hours to put these maps together, so it didn't take him very long to do it. Different towns are still in the process of putting their maps together. Some of them will be less um, less detailed than these maps are, um, but then other maps were produced by the University of Vermont and will have uh, very good data as well. So um, it, what it, what's important is that these maps can help uh, the town road crews and the town make decisions on where they're going to go first and and um, to tackle the trees. And so the road crew will have a copy of this and be able to, as they're working their roads, be able to identify where the where the ash is. So the next uh, step in this, after we get the inventory done, is to put the ash preparedness plan together. And this again is a, a was just such a help to have uh, Vermont Invasives and the and the website available to to glean tons of information from. It's probably one of the best websites I've ever seen. Um, we use the template from and, and we're able to insert our own data. Um, and then we'll we, we've developed plans for tree removal and developing a tree ordinance. Uh, again, help. From, um, putting a tree ordinance together with the department has helped. Department of Forests and Parks has helped a great deal with that um, to fine tune and, and hone what you want in your own community, um, and then to go on with the plan process, identifying priority roads and trees. Which where are you going to start? Um, in, in Enosburg, we actually made a made a decision at the uh, volunteer level. We still need to uh, go forward and talk to the uh, town decision makers, but we've decided that removing the trees over a 10-year period um, gives us the ability to change um, tax if uh, the emerald ash borer arrives or if we find new ways to, to fight back and save more ash. So at this point, we, the, there is no infestation. Um, we can take things a little slower to give the opportunity for the road crew to go out and um, select trees at, at, on the roads that they're actually working on. We, we identified about 650 trees or something like that on in Enosburg on our on 20 miles of road. Uh, so if we take down 65 trees a year, um, it'll be much more affordable for the community to to handle. So our finally, uh, this is my last slide for our our next steps. We we do still need to have uh, some communication with our with the road crew and the select board to come up with a budget. Uh, to be able to take these trees down. As Caitlin said, it's cheaper to take a live tree down than it is to take a dead tree down. So on the road crew will be doing this themselves, uh, most likely, uh, rather than hiring a tree service. So finding out what it's going to cost them to do it, present the plan to the town officials, and then start working on an outreach and education plan. We are uh, going to start that at town meeting day by providing a, a poster out front and a copy of the maps to look at. We will need to go to the select board to adopt this plan as well as town tree ordinance. And then it comes to implementation. As the road crew takes a tree down, every, we are expecting yearly to have another meeting, um, revamp the maps, and start again, which would be the plan amendment process. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Um, if people have questions for me on what our process was or, or how we might want to go forward, please feel free to do so. And maybe while we're um, waiting for those questions to come in, Caitlin, a couple of questions did pop up um, during Nancy's presentation that have been um, have been addressed by some of our um, participants, but didn't know if you wanted to add to any of those. Um, from Josh, question, um, do partially attacked trees give you some time to remove with normal felling techniques before too dangerous? Yeah, thanks, and I just recognize, thank you, Lars. Lars is one of our forest and parks uh, foresters who um, had answered Josh's question. So I'll just, I'll, I'll read it to you all. Um, the, you know, healthy ash trees can be killed in, in roughly three to five years. Um, Lars, you know, shared that in, in terms of becoming dangerous to drop, pre-existing factors could be, you know, need to look at decay, poor architecture, that sort of thing. Um, be, before that secondary decay could become an issue in, in making that felling dangerous. Um, EAB itself, because it just feeds on the phloem, which is just inside the bark itself, it doesn't make a tree um, structurally unsound. Um, so thanks, Lars, for that, that one. And then, Elise, was there another one, too? Down yeah, below? there's a question from Stephen um, around um, 
asking if assuming exit holes mean that mature adults have already left a given tree. Is there a way to detect presence of EAB before exit holes appear? Um, and Lars also was able to give an answer there that woodpeckers will go after the larva. So, um, that will cause the, the bark to appear lighter and blonded. So you end up, there's a, on our website, VT Invasives, we have a woodpecker watch, and you can find there some pictures of what Lars is talking about in terms of that blonding, which is kind of strips of lighter bark where the woodpeckers have peeled back. And you also might see little excavation holes um, where the woodpeckers have been digging for that larva. So, great. Thank you. And then I just also wanted to bring attention to Michael's a couple comments about students being great partners in this. Um, you know, Nancy had mentioned working with some college students, but certainly uh, eighth grade, middle school, even in Bennington, they worked with the, middle, the elementary school to help with the inventory. So students are great partners in this. Has anyone raised as only trees at Berkshire Elementary School? Oh, I haven't done anything with the town of Berkshire or at the Berkshire Elementary School. Um, are, I'm not sure. Are those the trees that only trees that were planted at the Berkshire Elementary School? Hopefully not. in their new with a new round of planting. Um, I'm not. I'm just not familiar with it. I can swing by there tomorrow, though. <laughs> Great. Well, um, if anyone has any other questions for Nancy, just uh, continue to use the chat box. Um, and now I think we'll pass it over to John um, to give us the, the story of Montpelier. Thank you. Um, with the two first detectors on the Mont Montpelier tree board, the board is quite aware of the Emerald dash borer and the threat to Vermont. And we were also aware that Montpelier was identified as a high risk for infestation based on the risk factors uh, were, which were listed in the UVM Extension Service Report uh, entitled Summary of EAB Risk Ranking by Town. So um, a small grant from the UVM Extension Vermont Urban and Community Forest Program provided the activation energy to develop a preparedness plan. Uh, thanks to uh, Caitlin Cusack, Kate Forer, Rhonda Mace, and Jay Lackey for their help and encouragement in the formul formulation of this plan. And I would also like to acknowledge the Minnesota DNR for the nice photo of Beetle Public Enemy Number 1. The preparedness plan that we've put together is a work in progress, as there will always be advances which may affect how we deal with this threat. However, we have already begun to implement the plan. And the first step was to begin an inventory of the ash trees in Montpelier and determine the extent of our vulnerability to uh, the EAB. I began surveying Herb Hubbard Park, uh, which is a place near and dear to me. You might ask, why start in a park? Uh, here on the uh, right is a dead tree believed to be an ash which died from causes other than EAB. The ash trees, as we have heard, become very brittle after dying, and this one had snapped off at a point 15 feet above the ground surface and planted itself right in the middle of a well-used trail. The broken portion that you can see extending up on the left was at least 30 feet long and supported by the neighboring tree until carefully removed by park staff. So there is a danger from these trees uh, to people using the park. Another reason to start in the park was the, uh, to practice inventory techniques and get GPS data on the trees within falling distance of the park trails. Again, for me, it was I like walking these trails, so this wasn't work. Uh, the result was a database, and this map generated uh, using Google Fusion tables. I identified just over 600 ash trees in and around the park. And I say around because that lower clump that you see at the bottom of the, of the if, if this is working, right down in here, these are ash trees that are located just behind the uh, State House building. Now, street trees were our next target, and the tree board and other volunteers were enlisted to survey the Montpelier street trees. We located over 500 street ash trees, as shown on this slide. The interesting thing about this map 
is that it's generated using Google Geo addresses. The address of the local residence nearest the tree is entered into a fusion table and Google plots the location on that basis. Bob Troster, who's a uh, very active volunteer with the tree board, got us going with Google fusion tables and geo addresses. Now armed with our inventory and some cost estimates for removing dying ash trees, we got this cost estimate from Jay Lackey of the Department of Far Forest Parks and Recreation. We were able to approach our city government with some estimates on what EAB could eventually cost the city for just the street ash alone. And that estimated cost was $220,000. We met with the city council and brought this uh, uh, sheet with us that uh, alerted that was intended to show them what our steps were in the plan uh, for pre-arrival and post-arrival EAB. And so we are working off this pre-arrival list right now and uh, we uh, basically informed them of the cost and made them aware of the problem. We were to learn uh, that the city of Montpelier is probably able to deal with the future costs for the street trees without taking any definitive action at this time. However, we raised with them the, pro the matter of ash trees on private property, which will need to be removed if infestation is identified. And although the tree board had recommended that it might be a good idea to establish a revolving loan fund for landowners who might not be financially able to deal with tree removal, the city council decided not to take any action at this time. Now from my walks around the city, some ash on private property will re require a crane to remove and often there are other large ash trees present. So these removal costs can easily head up into the thousands of dollars. It will probably, unfortunately, it will probably take the arrival of EAB to get any serious discussion on the revolving fund idea. Moving forward, the tree board intends to get an estimate of the number of ash trees on private property by inventorying a randomly selected group of residential lots in the city and extrapolating from those lots. To do an inventory of every parcel would be uh, too onerous. We, I don't think we could do it. So we will uh, do a statistical uh, subset of all the lots and extrapolate. At that point, we will be able to inform the residents regarding the potential future financial liability. Now, Montpelier is also divided up into capital area neighborhoods. The tree board hopes to get the residents in these neighborhoods involved with ash tree surveillance by promoting ash tree walks so residents can keep an eye on their ash trees in their, in their neighborhoods and report any unusual changes in tree health. And this map uh, is our map of the neighborhoods. We are also hoping to involve schools in this education effort and we'll work to develop a curriculum of kids, trees, and beetles to get elementary school children involved. The preparedness plan contains a preliminary curriculum under those, along those lines, rather. Finally, it's up to all of us to get the word out that people should not be, remo should not be moving firewood. As you can see here, the message has hit the comics. Um, Mark Trail uh, is basically advising folks don't transport potentially infested firewood. So if we've made the mainstream comics, uh, we are finally getting out there, getting the message out. He's very serious, as you can see. And I guess this ends my segment on the webinar. Thanks again to uh, the volunteers at Montpelier, uh, Bob Troster, and, and the rest for helping us out so far. Uh, John, this is Elise. There are a couple questions that came in while you were presenting. Oh. Um, first from Ken, okay. asking um, if the inventory that you you guys did in Montpelier only counted six inch DBH and larger trees or for what was your um, what was your criteria for ash trees? We, we didn't cut, cut it off at six inches. We probably uh, grabbed some three inch and up from there. Great, and then there's one more question from Mark. I'm wondering if there, um, in your EAB plan, um, is there no preemptive removal of currently healthy ash trees in Montpelier? Not at the present time. Okay, 
Okay, great. Well, Caitlin, we're going to hand it back over to you to, to uh, wrap us up tonight. Okie dokie, sounds great. Um, well, thanks so much, Nancy and John, for um, and really for all the other volunteers that are on tonight and that have been working with you for really caring for our community trees. Um, that uh, the work that you've done and um, in developing and doing uh, all the inventory and and really in many ways uh, kind of leading trailblazing for the rest of these communities is great. So um, thank you and congratulations. I also want to recognize uh, some of the staff, you know, Nancy being included in that role as well of assisting these communities, but also Jim Esden, Jay Lackey, and then Lars, who was uh, luckily chiming in on our uh, chat box there, to um, all the staff at Forest and Parks as well who are supporting these communities. So as I mentioned, um, we're a year into this process, um, and there are several communities who have begun um, this. And, and based on conversations with these volunteers and, and listening to Nancy and John tonight, I'll summarize some of the lessons learned for you all. Um, and I'd also invite Nancy, you and John to chime in um, and, and others to share in the chat box because I know I see there's some Amalia and is from Hartford, Bob Everingham uh, from Brattleboro have, have all joined the, the conversation. So um, I guess what I would first uh, bring, bring and, and uh, say is that students are a really great catalyst um, and boots and boots on the ground. Um, and they've been helpful, as you've heard, in inventory, in creating maps, in information gathering, and really validating that local knowledge. Um, so for communities, Brattleboro, Hartford, and then you heard Nancy share about Bakersfield, Richford, um, and then Middlebury, Bennington, Rutland, Williston, and Essex have all actually worked with students to um, do their inventories. Uh, Michael had mentioned elementary school students and middle school students um, are great partners in this. And I guess I just also, in, in our experience and the experience some of the communities have had, you know, just to be realistic about expectations for students um, and that, you know, most students, we have a couple that have actually continued on um, in working with towns, but most students aren't as invested in the long term as local citizens, but they're great boots on the ground, great energy, and great at doing a lot of research. Um, and there is some level of hand-holding and quality control uh, that, that needs to be done uh, in working with them, um, as well as just oversight and, and providing them with clear direction. Uh, but over the past year, we had 40 stu 42 students that helped these communities, um, and it certainly makes a great service learning project um, for them. And the other thing that I would I would mention is is that really um, it's important to think of this as a as a rapid assessment uh, the inventory at this point um, and really thinking about collecting you know the minimum data needed in order to determine those costs and and management steps um, windshield sur surveys have been the preferred technique um, you know it's and it's really important not to get bog bogged down and take too long at doing the inventories because really it's just to get a quick estimate of what is the potential impact and you saw how um, Nancy approached it and how Montpelier approached it and I, I would also mention that um, we have an intern that's going to be um, developing some case studies of all the other communities that have done these ash inventories up till now that can be used as a resource for those that are considering um, uh, taking this on and uh, just to give a sense of what are the tools out there and the approaches that different communities are, are using. Um, and really to think about collecting the basic information needed. Um, and, you know, in a more urban setting, certainly diameter size class, um, health, location, these are all things that um, here we see on the map of South Burlington that a group of UVM students collected for that town. Um, and they did collect a data on a little over 600 trees. And that data was then used by the city arborist, Craig Lambert, to develop his animal dashboard plan. Um, related to the inventory piece, I know that the volunteers in Hartford really brought up um, some safety concerns. And so they definitely re recommend thinking about, you know, bright safety vests and lights for cars while doing these inventories. I would mention that, you know, tree ID can be difficult for volunteers and students. Um, you know, as a professional, I get stumped by trees. And so uh, one way that we found, here's the group in the photo, this is the group of Johnson Conservation Commission members who um, inventoried their back roads. And three um, volunteers were to a car, and we made sure that at least in each car there was someone very comfortable with tree ID. And this could be, you know, a local forester or arborist or a local naturalist or again, someone who's who's pretty proficient in that. Um, 
Also, just really maintaining realistic expectations. I mentioned some of those expectations for students um, and volunteers, and also, you know, figuring out the best way to engage staff who may have more um, technical expertise that can be in, that can be um, of assistance in in guiding your community, and can help um, shepherd the process. And then I would also say to keep that uh, communities, um, Hartford and some of the other communities have found that keeping that core planning group um, sm as small enough, kind of there's sort of that ideal tipping point size, where as, as Nancy mentioned, you know, you, you want to have enough people to spread the work out, but you don't want to have too many people to get bogged down in all of the, the uh, logistics of, of um, coming to consensus. So um, as I mentioned, the key people that, you know, Nancy found up in Franklin County were Conservation Commission members, uh, first detectors, you know, number here in this picture, Sue Lovering on the, on the right is um, certainly one right here, here's Sue. Um, first detectors I know have been involved in all of this, uh, Parks and Recreational members in Hartford, their tree board members, and then really thinking about who are those movers and shakers who really influence people that can be really effective as well in, um, in uh, the outreach and education piece. And so I would say, speaking of which, um, that really, you know, as we heard from Nancy, um, is important at, at really all stages of that plan development. Um, so in Hartford, their tree warden, first detector, and tree board members have featured pests in their an annual reports, sponsored walks, met with their public st uh, work staff, like Nancy had done um, in Enosburg, to talk about the issue and talk about budgeting. In Richford, this uh, photo at the top here, Annette, Annette Goyne, uh, first detector and local teacher, enlisted the help of the Boy Scouts uh, to spread the word in their Fourth of July play parade. And here we have Bob Everingham, a first detector down in Brattleboro, who um, hung a purple trap in a high profi profile area. And I didn't include this photo, Bob, but it was a great one of him dressed up as an EAB in the Strolling of the Heifers parade. So again, here's just a couple of examples of great ways that volunteers are spreading the word in their communities. I would say, um, you know, budgeting, tree management policies are, you know, in the end made at the municipal level, but I think Nancy made a pretty compelling uh, argument for how collaborating between towns um, it really um, is advantageous for a number of different reasons. Um, for sharing resources, coordinating that, that message, that multi-town education, and eventually jointly fundraising, uh, and really just sharing lessons learned and not needing to reinvent the meal you know, even from sharing how they were approaching their inventory to how are we going to deal with, you know, the policies around removing these trees. And then, uh, as, as I'm sure all of those who have been involved up until now, you're really being realistic about time and, and having fun with it. And particularly the education outreach piece can be a lot of fun. I know Sue Lovering and Johnson provides food and pastries at each meeting and event, so just I'll throw that out there. When she holds a meeting, you're bound to have some delicious desserts. Um, and I'd also share something that Little Tree, a first detector in Hartford, noted um, uh, in reflecting on his experience. He said, I'm concerned about invasives taking over. EAB wiping out ash is scary. The planning pr process is not going to go fast. Be patient and chip away at it. Education in, is key and will be more and more important into the future. And so again, be, being realistic about time and really spreading out those tasks as Nancy recommended. And so I would just sort of end with the final lesson learned, and that's really that the volunteer first detectors and other local tree champions, conservation com commission members have really been the critical um, factor in, in the success of, of that, and that the, it really depends on the level of local leadership and capacity to mobilize people and, and towns and their leadership into action. Um, many of you have taken the, who have taken the first detector training will remember Jim as in statement that the X factor is you. Um, so here I'll just share, this is the Hartford EAB planning group, uh, Brad Goodkeep, Amalia Torres, Little Tree, and who's missing is uh, Linda Luzier and Claire Forseth, who were awarded this year the Vermont Tree Stored Volunteer Group Award for their, their um, work in, in planning for the Amherst Ashbar. They now have a draft EAB plan. And then here on the right is uh, Sue Lovering, who was awarded the Unsung Hero Award. And these are just two of um, many of you that, that really should all be recognized um, and have been instr instrumental for your work. So I just wanted to quickly share some of the resources that Nancy and, and uh, John had mentioned using. So we have a planning worksheet 
right here that you can use um, to, it's available on our website, VT Invasives. We have tree policy templates, um, which um, can be used and we can work with, with your community to develop a local tree ordinance. And then online there's also a, a resource toolbox that provides everything from inventory protocols to, uh, you know, I, uh, thoughts and, and things to consider in, in dealing with disposal and utilization of infested wood. Uh, and then we've got lots of outreach materials that you're welcome um, to use. Just give me a call and I'll, I'll pop them in the mail to you. This is a trifold um, card that not only shares information about the Emerald Ash Borer, but also about um, that horrible past the Asian longhorn beetle and the Hemophilia delgid. We have posters, um, tattoos, uh, all sorts of fun things for you. Um, and then Nancy mentioned that all the towns that she worked with applied for this $500 incentive. Um, Hartford and several other communities uh, have. There's still $3,000 left. Um, so there's $500 available for six communities. You can apply online. Shoot me an email if you have trouble finding it. But again, it's on VT Invasives under tree pests. Um, and then technical assistance. Be in touch with me if you'd like um, some uh, assistance with information or if you're holding a public information meeting that you would like um, someone uh, to come speak at. So as I mentioned, this is available on our website, VT Invasives. And then if you go to tree pests, it'll put a drop down menu and then you'll see community preparedness. And if you click on that, it'll get you to all these planning templates. Um, I would also say that we have a monthly e-news that you can sign up on the website that provides not only info on pests but also plants. Uh, like us on our Facebook page, look up Vermont. Um, and then just a couple ideas for other ways to get involved. April 27th to May 3rd, Vermont is hosting its first Ash Tree Awareness Week. So come celebrate our community ash sets with us. Uh, the goals of which are to celebrate and recognize the valuable contributions of trees and continue to raise awareness about the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, so if you're interested in hosting events in your community, shown here is a tree tag that uh, several communities have actually hosted these events, Burlington, Johnson, Montpelier, uh, I know there's a couple others that I'm, that I'm forgetting, but um, we'll provide the tags and some background information for you. Uh, we'll provide uh, materials that you can use to uh, have a display and information at Green Up Day. So again, be in touch with me if you're interested um, in getting involved. I would also say here is, so you all are getting the sneak peek at one of the uh, Growing Words of Art, Art contest entries. And these are uh, submitted by students in K through 8. And they are um, artwork on the topic this year of benefits of ash trees. And so you'll see one of the submissions. Um, these are then uh, selected a winner from each grade and turned into tree trading cards. So there's still time for that. Um, and that inf information is available on our uh, website. And then related to Arbor Day, which is May 2nd, um, we're going to take it on the road. In the past, we've had it at the State House, but this year, we'll support your community with $500 and some staff support in hosting an Arbor Day celebration. So this could be a tree planting, it could be a tree tagging, you name it. Um, so we'll be announcing a, a pretty easy, simple, quick paragraph a proposal process in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we look forward to your, um, your thoughts. And then the final thing I just want to mention is the state will be hosting a photo contest this March with the theme of hashtag ash benefits. And this is to really gather some great photos and stories of what ash trees mean to Vermonters. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And then the other thing that I would just reiterate is that we hope to have Nancy and John shared some of the tools and approaches that they um, took to dealing with the ash inventory. And so we hope to gather th those stories and then the uh, others from Brattleboro and some other communities of how they approach this and put that on our website. So I will sort of wrap up there and check to see if there's any questions that came in. Oh, nice, Kate. She's got the Facebook page link. That's yeah, great. Caitlin, it looks like there's a question about um, growers, garden centers. Um, are they slowing down the sale of ash? Let's see. Growers, garden centers, slowing down the sale of ash. Um, I, from what I'm aware, not, not many garden centers are selling ash anymore. Um, I know that the town of Heinsberg actually had, in a recent development, had some ash planted that one of our volunteers had uh, noticed, but I think now most most uh, nurseries are not not selling them anymore. And at one point, I saw VJ 
Kamai, who's the owner of South 40, on the on the uh, webinar. So I don't know, VJ, if you have any thoughts on that um, from you know your I know you've got a bunch of ash in your nursery that are that obviously have not, are not are not sold. So um, if you have any thoughts on that? Great. Well, we um, are a little bit over on time, so we'll start to wrap up. Um, I want to thank Caitlin and Nancy and John again for sharing with us. This was, I think, really great and valuable for um, all the participants. So, and thanks, thanks to everybody that's been um, staying with us in this hour. So, um, there is a uh, an evaluation that um, we would love if you could fill out, so we can, um, you know, try to make these webinars more efficient and more useful and meaningful for you. So um, Kate just uh, put the link to the SurveyMonkey evaluation in the chat box. Um, it should just take you a minute to fill out, so we'd really appreciate it again if you could do that. Um, and um, our next webinar is actually going to be rescheduled for the fall. Um, we have a, a webinar on tree ordinances that was originally scheduled for March 19th, and um, we'll be sending out some information in the next couple days about um, when that will be rescheduled, but it will not be happening in March. Um, and the reason is that um, our stewardship of the urban landscape course, um, the first day of that this spring will be actually on March 19th. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's, there's a number of you um, um, that are still in the room that have gone through the full course. Um, this is our our big um, training. It's a statewide effort to get more um, people excited about trees and um, in the know on urban and community forestry. So um, here's some information about um, Seoul and Kate. Again, just uh, slipped in the Seoul uh, program website into the chat box. So if you want to find out anything more about um, the course and the format, and uh, if you'd like to sign up, then please follow that link, and uh, we'll hopefully see some of you then. So uh, with that, I think we are at the very end, and we want to thank you all again for coming, and um, join us again in the future. Thanks.